Hello and welcome to the Alpha Movement Podcast. My name is Tom Foxley and on today's show, I'm joined by the one, the only, Coach Mike Bergner. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of Moke, um, Moke, Mike Bergner, he is an awesome, awesome coach. He's someone that's really influenced me, not only as an athlete, his programming is something that I've followed for a long, long time, but also as a coach, his coaching methodology and the... The, just the way he coaches is something really to be admired and if you haven't checked out some of his videos and his training i would highly 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 recommend you do so now one little caveat before we get into what's coming on in the show this is a show that was littered with technical difficulties from my mic breaking to poor internet connection so if at times there's it chops around and you kind of think that was a weird jump Tom took then in his questioning. It was the internet connectivity and um, yeah, it was a tough one to record. I've tried to get rid of all of the, the hissing and cracking that my mic produced um, and sorry any audio technicians, but it will be fine, I promise. So what's suggested or what's uh, what's talked about in this show? We have um, coaching as a skill, like what to go through in that. We have uh, so much about Olympic weightlifting, obviously. Um, we have a 78-year-old in... Um, in Mike's terminology, hard ass uh, Ollie lifting priest, which is pretty fucking cool. And um, we've got so much more besides that. And this is also in in the show. Mike mentioned a ten point guide, which is just incredible. And I have managed to get my hands on that, and it's hosted in the Alpha Athletes page 2.0. It's basically a, a guide for maxing out on your lifts. And if you head to um, Facebook and search for Alpha Athletes page 2.0 and request access, you can get that that for free so without further ado here is coach mike bergner well mike thank you for jumping on the show as i already said i really really appreciate your time um and i think the best place to start is by asking you kind of how how the, your experience in the military because i i think you're in the marines wasn't it was i was yes okay. how does that affect your time or how does that affect your weightlifting coach well uh, Marines are always, I was a Marine officer, I was a captain in the Marine Corps and I was with a special outfit, a uh, force reconnaissance outfit. Um, and we were taught at a very uh, early time in our experience of going through boot camp and training to lead by example. And uh, uh, Marines are typically very uh, forceful in their nature of speech uh it's one of those things where you know you speak you learn to speak from the, uh, a little bit more uh, trying to make the uh, the uh, student or your men be a little bit more attentive uh to what your commands are but never asking them to do anything that you wouldn't do yourself so uh, the marine corps experience for me was uh it is my coaching style. Uh, when I'm not coaching, uh, I'm, I'm on one side of the line, but when I am coaching, I'm on the other side of the line. And uh, uh, I learned in the Marine Corps, too, that we can take complex movement patterns or such as drill or uh, teaching somebody how to, how to become a Marine from a civilian we can take those complex movements, patterns, and make them simple through our speech or through our study. Uh, and that's what I try to do. And I think the Marine Corps has given me a great advantage in, in learning how to do that. As well as, as my students who taught me how to teach, basically, because as an early teacher just out of the Marine Corps, um, I was very forceful with the students and uh i try probably try to be a little bit more technical with i did notice there's um something that definitely carried on the military experience there when you um I, I was watching a video of you and you said you don't use a hooker if i'm not coaching you um so there's that kind of, <laughs> there's that aggressive kind of uh no bullshit and i really like that how did that i'm guessing that was just the kind of the military experience or was there anything else kind of earlier in life that kind of triggered that approach to teaching no, I, I, I'm a pretty black and white guy. I mean, I, I, I'm still learning at 70 years old. I, I open myself up to learning and, and, uh, I want to, uh, make myself a better coach for the people that I work with. But, uh, 
I, I have a philosophy and, and it's, it's not my way or the highway. It's just not the way it is. But there are some things that, um, that if I can't get my athlete to do that are very simple to do, uh, then um, I just won't coach them. I mean, it's, it's very simple. Uh, I don't think I, – I think the hook grip is something that is in the early beginning is an uncomfortable uh, feeling for some athletes, for some people, and they won't give it a try. And, uh, and so for me, um, everybody that I coach has to use a hook grip. And, and if I go to a course and I'm teaching a course and people have to use a hook grip, then when they go home and I'm not around them, then, uh, you know, I can't see it. So, I uh, I, I won't say anything, but, uh, obviously, but, uh, <laughs> if, if they videoed, uh, a shot of a lift and they weren't using the hook grip, I would, uh, I would really, uh, I would, I would get, get on them pretty harshly. Yeah. Good stuff. Stuff. Um, I've also seen you shouting. Uh, was it strong turnover in one of the videos, um, or getting right. getting the athlete to coach strong tur- uh, to shout strong turnover as well? What's the thinking behind that? Well, it, it's part of the burden of warm up. You know, there's there's five movement patterns in the burden of warm up, and each one of them has a, um, a a purpose. As an example, and uh, for an example, the the one you're talking about is the uh, muscle snatch. And the purpose of the muscle snatch is to make me strong in that turnover. It, it's an upper body strength move is all it is. And the, the momentum of the barbell has already been created in a normal snatch. But the phrase catch drives me freaking crazy. Why is that? Uh, well, it's just because it's like catching a football. It's like catching a barbell. You don't catch a barbell. You receive the barbell and you have to be connected with the barbell. And that strong turnover creates the speed as your feet move. When your feet move and they're going from a, what I call a jumping position to the receiving position, then if I have a weak turnover, if I'm weak in that, that turn over, then I don't get the speed that I need to get. People do not understand the snatch appropriately. They think, if I brought if I, if I brought a newbie in my gym and I asked them to watch this professional snatch, and I said, "Explain what he's doing." Ninety percent of the people that are new that come into my gym and they see that, they'd say, "Well, he's just pulling that bar over his head. That's all he's doing." Yeah. And that is not at all what the snatch is, you know. So the the strong turnover that that strengthening of that upper back, the strengthening. And learning the timing of that pull gives me the speed that I need to position myself and to receive and to punch myself under that bar. Okay, excellent. So, so that's a very important part of the burning warm up. No, it's, it's definitely something that's um, neglected as well. I, it's something exactly. I, I, I see the whole time people just kind of floating around under a bar as opposed to kind of actively being aggressive with it. How did your. Um, how did your weightlifting journey begin? Uh, interesting question because it, my father was a, uh, a dairy man. He was a farmer, owned a dairy, uh, and his his methodology of getting strong was to work hard, baling hay, shoveling coal. We were we were had a coal furnace. I had to shovel coal, and so he thought I could become very very strong doing that hard manual labor. Uh, but I got a football scholarship to the University of Notre Dame. And uh, um, when I went up there, I only weighed 165 pounds, about, you know, about 75 kilos. And my coaches wanted me to weigh about uh, 85 kilos. And so they sent me down to the weight room, which at that time in 1964 and 65, no one had weight rooms. It was just hard work is what it was. But Notre Dame had a, a Catholic priest by the name of Father Lang, uh, and he had a weight room. It was only about uh, 1,500 square feet, but his philosophy was Olympic-style weightlifting. And so Father Lang taught me how to, how to do the lifts, and uh, I went from 165 pounds to 185 pounds, and my speed in the 40-yard 40, 40 dash improved. That's incredible. There's a... Uh 
<laughs> a priest that was teaching weightlifting. It, yeah, you, it was. It were. When you when you go back to that kind of, or when you think of uh, priest Lang or Father Lang, what's the what's the first memory that comes to mind? Uh, no nonsense. He was. Uh, he told you what he thought. He said what he meant. Meant what he said. Um, he was at the time that I got to be with him. He was about seventy-eight years old. At one time, he was uh, the fourth strongest man in the world, um, and you know he was a hard ass. He was extremely disciplined, and uh, he wouldn't put up with any shenanigans or um, you know. And so, all of my friends that became weightlifters, we gravitated to him, and and even to this day, we have a annual reunion that honors him. And, uh, we call ourselves the Flabbers, the Father Lang Alumni Board. <laughs> if you were going to take someone, it hypothetically could be me, if you're going to take someone who um, was about 80 kilos and wanted to get from 100 kilo snatch to 120 kilo snatch in six months, what would you, what would your, and you had a million dollars on the line, what would your approach be? It'd be the same. I, I teach, I teach everybody the same, whether they're beginner or not. And we started to, I have to evaluate them first. And the first thing that I evaluate is mobility. Uh, I want to see where that is. And uh, if the person's got a, if he's got no mobility, why would I want him to lift and lift the wrong way? You know, I mean, so my first intention is to give them the mobility that they need. I can teach them speed with the movement of the feet. And then the last thing is strength. And in in between the, that time period of six months, they actually reverse. The, if a person gets the mobility, and I know I can teach him the strength or the uh, speed, then now I have to work on uh, the strength and the various positions that, that, that the snatch or the clean and jerk entail. Because the, the fundamentals of teaching and the fundamentals of coaching are the same. It's the stance, the grip, and positions. And, and stance and grip are easy, but positions, there's a million positions, and you have to learn to hit those positions. So I fondly say slow is smooth, smooth is fast, positions in a very slow and decisive manner, and then we speed up those positions. So if I can get those positions dialed in, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, uh, that that athlete is going to be improved. And and if I have an athlete that's snatching 100 kilos, and he wants to he wants to do 120 in in uh, six months, there's a lot of things that we have to work on. I mean, if his mobility is good, then then he's probably just not strong enough, and I have to get him strong in the various positions that that he's hitting. He may not be hitting his positions. My philosophy is vertical hip involvement. I like the Russian Polish philosophy of vertical hips. I don't like the catapult method of horizontal hips. I don't like to have the bar swing away from my body. I like to keep it as close to my body as I possibly can. But those are all positions that I have to I have to work with that athlete and then my job is to coach that athlete in those positions and get him strong enough in those positions so that he can hit them to make that 20 kilo uh, uh, PR, our personal best in six months. Okay. So when you're looking at common injury or sorry, common mobility issues, what's the ones that pop up all the time and how is, or what's your favorite method of addressing them? Well, typically the, the most common for me is, is the, uh, the ankles, knees and hips, obviously shoulders. Those are the things that I look at first. Um, you know, if, if the ankles are very inflexible, then the torso is going to be more of a leaning torso where it's going to go more of a 45 degree angle torso. And then the bar is going to be way back. Um, and it's not going to be a very strong position. So we just, uh, we have to understand that Olympic style weightlifting is a, it's a vertical sport. The chest we'd like to have, depending on the somotyping of the athlete, we like to have in a perfect world, uh, the chest to be as, as straight as it can be, and then the bar overhead so that it lines up with the hips and through the uh, middle of the foot. Um, and so if I have an athlete that 
has no ability to do that, the one thing that I have done many times is switch them from the uh, less efficient split snatch okay. and then continue, continue to work on mobility for, you know, the ankles, knees and hips and shoulders. Yeah. What's that transition like when you come back from a split snatch to a, a standard squat snatch? Well, it's, it, the squat snatch is obviously more efficient, it's, it's, uh, but the pull is exactly the same. So whether or not that I, I have a burden of warm-up that has five exercises in it for the squat snatch, but in the, in the uh, split snatch, I take away one of the exercises and uh, only have four exercises. So we practice that on a daily basis, and we don't, we don't spend hours and hours and hours doing that burden of warm-up. We do it every single day. It takes about... Burden warm up and the skill transfer exercises take about, I don't know, two minutes to do. We do it every day, regardless of what the workout is. You know, you could be doing Fran or Angie or whatever the heck it is, but if you do this every single day, and I like to do the junkyard dog, which is a jumping exercise, because in my, my opinion, the snatch and the, and the clean and the jerk are very mimic a jumping uh, acceleration type situation. It's just, it's not a jump high, but it's a very jump hard against the ground, creating acceleration on the barbell. And then as that barbell moves up, I have to pull myself around the barbell and then punch my body down underneath it. So if, if I can't get that athlete into that good squatting position, about 99% of the time, even 99.9% .9 of the time, I can teach them how to get into that position by doing a split, which is a lunge, basically. And we start at the very beginning, teaching them how to lunge properly. But the pull is exactly the same. The positions are exactly the same. The only difference is, is that the, the, the height of the bar has to get a little bit higher than the squat because it takes a little bit longer for me to split my legs front and back to get and push myself underneath the bar. Okay, and I'm presuming you can't get as low in a split snatch as well. Uh, it's close. Uh, you can't get it as low, but it's very, very close. You can certainly. What I find is that when individuals have a hard time with their mobility, they want to pull the bar up, and you know, instead of driving the bar up, when the weight starts getting heavy, especially, and then and and order for them to get lower rather than squatting under the bar because they can't with the mobility they start throwing their feet out wider and wider and wider mm -hmm. well in the split snatch i can get much lower than i can uh in a power snatch so there's about a i would say there's probably a four to maybe four inches difference you know we we've measured it before and uh years ago we just have to get we have to get the athlete committed to it and we have to get the athlete to understand that they don't drop they don't catch but they have to pull themselves around this object okay and so that the, the idea is is that you know i have to create acceleration on the barbell through my legs i want to keep that bar as close to my body as i possibly can as that bar is going up because of the drive of my legs now I engage my arms, and I have to have a good, strong finish, not straight up and down, but a little finish, leaning back a little bit to pull myself around this object, keeping that bar close to me. And that's where the, the idea of an athlete, you know, um, not finishing or the athlete uh, it finishes improperly where it's straight up, that athlete will intuitively swing the bar out away from them and they'll swing it out away from the least line of resistance and uh when the weight gets heavy they will not make that lift okay so you mentioned right at the beginning that you have a a method for um for checking mobility what does that system look like well the first thing i do is i ask him that you know we we always do talk about the stance and the grip first you know i mean that's that's the basics and so the width of the grip is very important for an athlete and that age of that athlete. Uh, if they're a young athlete, obviously, and they don't have the bone density worked up, uh, then, you know, I might move the grip in a little bit. But basically, I just have them go into an overhead squat 
and I checked I checked their ankle flexibility, I checked their knee flexibility and their hip flexibility and their shoulder flexibility just by visualization. Um, I think from there, I diagnose what the athlete needs and, uh, uh, and we start working on it. And one of the best, I, I, I want the athlete to feel what I'm asking them to do. So if an athlete has poor ankle flexibility, I will put their feet on a plate, you know, their heels on a plate and uh, uh, ask them to do an overhead squat. And it's like the light bulb goes off, you know, for them. It's like, oh, my God, I get it. You know, I mean, I have to make my body this way. And I like the active stretching, the implement in my hand. So, so depending on the athlete's uh, issues, uh, most most of the athletes, have, uh, uh, they get frustrated because they can't get down in the squat, but they don't know what that's supposed to feel like. So I'll put I'll put a uh, five kilo plate underneath each of the heels in the width of uh, uh, width of their stance for an overhead squat, and then I'll have them squat underneath it, uh, just doing an overhead squat. And that that obviously uh, brings their chest up into a more vertical position, and uh, uh, they get that feel. So what I ask them to do then is to, you know, uh, several times during the day take the take the PVC pipe and do an overhead squat without the plates, and then you know do an overhead squat with the plates and get the feeling of what it's like to uh, do the overhead squat with the, the feet underneath the plates. And that's what you're trying to mimic. That's what you're trying to feel. And uh, uh, it, it has been very successful because that athlete has never felt that position that he needs to get in. And so once they feel that position and then they go back and do it without the heels on the plate, uh, they can they can actually feel and determine where their deficiencies are, and most of the time the athlete can correct the deficiencies on their own. Okay. Um, when when you kind of look at the standard CrossFit weightlifting approach, what's or not the CrossFit weightlifting the standard approach used in CrossFit boxes? What's the thing that stands out to you that needs to change? Well, you know I. For, for me, I guess it is. I, I, I'm not a CrossFit coach. I'm an Olympic weightlifting coach. Um, so for me, I like, I, I want all of my athletes, and, and it has greatly improved over the last 10 years. I want my athletes to have, you know, great technique. Um, so I developed, when I was a high school teacher, I developed a program called the, the 10 point uh, grading system on maxing out. And, uh, it's, uh, you know, for an example, you got for the setup in the, in the, in the, in the snatch or the clean, it didn't matter. You got two points for the proper setup. And then when you raise the bar off the ground and you brought the bar into that good position of, uh, you know, the hang position, you got two points. And, and then there's five, there's five segments, five points that each get two points. And so, um, that's really what I'm trying to achieve. I, I want them to be able to hit those positions that way, or I won't count the lift. And so for me in the CrossFit world, you know, when you have something like Grace, or you have something like Isabel, um, the time component is very, very important for, for the athlete, obviously. But uh, it's just been my philosophy that I would rather have my athletes hit that eight out of the 10 points before I'd count the lift. And so I'll give you a perfect example. My daughter-in-law was a 2008 Olympian. First time she ever did Isabel. Now here's a girl that snatched 105 kilos, held the American record for several years. Um, and she, first time she ever did Isabel, she, it took her seven minutes to do it. And uh, because she did the standard, you know, set up and, you know, dropping the bar, getting set up again. She did all the things that a weightlifter would do. And about two days later, I said, I told her, I said, Natalie, listen up. I want you to just do the snatches as fast as you can. Don't drop the bar. Just do touch and goes. 
and her technique was tens every time. And the time that she achieved after doing that, you know, that uh, 30 snatches was under uh, under three minutes. It was like 2.45 or That's something. Incredible. Like that. So, I mean, 2.45 is a good time anyway you look at it. And uh, But, you know, and, and Josh Everett is like a son to me. But he will do a rounded back muscle snatch very quickly. He's very fast, and he'll do it under 60 seconds. I would rather have the athlete do Natalie's technique than I would have the athlete do Josh's technique. Um, and so for me, Olympic style weightlifting is it, it's, it's so great for crossfitters. And I love that Coach Klassman recognizes that. I mean, he's a gymnast. He was a former gymnast. He recognizes the, the importance of the Olympic, Olympic style weightlifting. But in the real world of things, Olympic style weightlifting uh, in the competitions is a very small part of what CrossFit competitions are all about. However, good form in those lifts will make that CrossFit athlete more efficient, stronger, more powerful for the things that he has to do or she has to do for the competitions. Perfect. Has there ever been anything when in, like in, in terms of coaching or programming, has there ever been anything that's really surprised you that's worked, anything that's kind of come out of the blue? You mean within the CrossFit world or Olympic style world? Within, yeah, I'd probably say within Olympic style weightlifting. Yeah, I, you know, the, the, the fact that these athletes are lifting gargantuan weights, I think we're on the verge of having a, a 600 pound clean and jerk. Uh, yeah, I, I think you know it's going to be very, very soon. Uh, the athletes are much, much, much stronger than we were back in the day. The um, you know the technique of the athletes are are much, much better than they were back in my day. Um, and you know, and you know, back in my day, not very many people lifted. And now you take a look at the athletes. Uh, USA weightlifting is just uh, skyrocketed because of CrossFit, and there's more and more people that get the bug for Olympic style weightlifting, and and they like to do both of them. But many of them even switch over to uh, Olympic style weightlifting so that they can compete and have fun, and they get addicted to it. And then once in a while they'll do CrossFit, and then of course then there's the ones that are diehard CrossFitters. That that use the Olympic lifts to make themselves better for the, uh, you know, for the CrossFit world. But uh, the world of Olympic style weightlifting is in 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 the Olympics is really growing, and I think that uh, I think it's even going to get better. And and I do know in the United States we've gone when I was on the board of directors on USA Weightlifting, we had probably 3,000 members. And now I understand there's close to 15,000 members within USA Weightlifting. And those members are all that were brought in are probably 85 to 90% of them are all CrossFitters. That's fantastic. That's, that's really, really good. Um, is there an element of weightlifting you think is either underestimated or completely misunderstood? Why well, I, I do? I think I think people don't do not understand, especially beginners. The you know the guys, the guys from China that start at six and seven and eight years old with PVC pipe and don't lift the bar uh, until they're nine or ten. They only use they only grow through positions with the PVC pipe. I think that uh, uh, in the United States, you know, especially they want to lift weights too hard, too fast, too heavy. And their technique suffers. So for me, again, you know, uh, I we try to take, you know, things from the top down, and then you know, tear everything down, and then build it back up from the bottom up. And and uh, again, we we go back to our fundamentals of coaching and fundamentals of teaching, and that stance grip and positions. And stance and grip are easy, and they're they're once they're taught, or they may be changed a little bit depending on the athlete, but the positions are ongoing and have to be mastered before that athlete can really achieve his potential. And uh, uh, I'll take a, I'll take a quote from Chris Somer, who used to be the United States, uh, you know, junior national gymnastics coach. He and I spent a lot of time together and, 
And, and Somer has, in gymnastics, he has a, a philosophy that it takes a beginning athlete about three to five years to reach 75% of his potential. And then another year or two to gain another 5% of his potential. So it's, so it's a journey. And, uh, I certainly can bring two athletes in, um, in the arena. And, uh, one athlete is going to try to muscle through it and they're going to achieve a certain level very quickly. But I'm going to take the athlete that is going to listen to me and he's going to do the complex movement patterns every day in a very simplistic form and we're going to hit them and even though that athlete that is is coming in and muscle it will achieve a certain level much much faster my athlete that does it the right way and it'll take him much longer but he'll surpass the athlete that is doing it the wrong way Exactly. That's so refreshing to hear. It's so nice to hear something like that. Um, people get so ego driven and obsessed right. with the, the final outcome, like racing towards like, just like, it's one of those many examples where you have to go slow to go fast, I think. It, well, that's what I said, you know, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. We, it, you know, it's amazing because people come up here, we, we open our gyms up for athletes that need help. And, um, you see some very, very good athletes that are snatching 100 kilos, as you mentioned earlier, and yet their technique sucks. So they will be they will be stifled at 100 kilos for a very long time, and they they may hit 105 once in a while, or maybe maybe even get to 110, but they will never achieve that 120 uh, kilo goal and desire until they learn how to lift properly. And in they have to they have to understand the mechanics of the lift. And so I'm a very visual person. So I, I use visual cues to try to get them to understand what the snatch, what the clean, what the jerk are really all about. And it's 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 not about pulling on the bar. It's 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 about driving with your legs, creating acceleration. And when that bar is going up you are going under, but you're not dropping under because dropping under is too slow. You are now pulling yourself around this object, the barbell, and then you have to punch your body down into that low overhead squat position. And when you time that the right way, the athlete becomes very, very quickly. If you try to pull the barbell up, with your feet on the ground or you try to muscle that barbell up, it's a very slow movement pattern and they just will not generate that second component, that speed that they need to have. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of complex thinking that has to go on. And, you know, I use, you know, uh, visual cues. I use uh, videos. I use pictures to reinforce what I'm talking about. And, uh, and I think that's been where my success has, has, uh, has been in that as a school teacher, kids that I taught initially, I tried to be, you know, I didn't mean to be, but I tried to be, you know, more complex than I should have been. For an example, I'd say, you know, you have to ankle, hip and knee extension to get the, the momentum on the barbell, ankle, knee and hip extension. And I had a 15 year old student of mine who was, you know, a, a real genius in physics. And she says, well, coach, why don't you just say jump? You know, and, uh, um, you know, and that was probably 40 years ago. And I've been using the word jump ever since. And I can get a, a person to jump. And, you know, again, I have to coach not jump high, but I have to coach drive hard against the ground with keeping your feet flat as you can for as long as you can in order to stay balanced and create that momentum on the barbell. And as that barbell is going up, now I pull with my arms. I have to hit that good finish position, but now I pull with my arms as my feet are moving away to receive the bar because my feet are going to be more narrow initially so I can get the drive against the ground. And then when I receive the bar, I move my feet out to get the seat speed and the stability. And then I have to pull myself around that barbell and punch my body down into that good position. 
So there's a lot of there's a lot of mechanics and understanding that the athlete has to go through before that they can really make the improvements that they want. And my philosophy is is that I won't let them snatch if they're not doing it the right way. We'll do snatch pulls. We'll do you know we'll do the you know obviously do burden and warm up you know in the skill transfer exercises every single day. And and we will make improvements. I won't let them do it the wrong way. We'll go down to a certain point where it's the right way. We'll stretch, 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 come back up, and then go down and make hopefully a little bit more as long as it's the right way. And it's a process. It takes time. And that's where the frustration comes in with a lot of athletes. They don't want to spend the time. But I'm asking them to give me 10 minutes a day doing those movement patterns and the jumping exercises and doing it the right way, and then go do whatever workout you want to do. Just don't snatch and don't clean and jerk until, you know, until you do it the right way. Because I believe that practice makes permanent. It, you know, it's, exactly. if, you do it, if you do it the right way, then you're going you're gonna to get it, and it's going to be permanent. But if I do it the wrong way, it's going to be permanent as well. It's going to be harder to break. And you're going to have to come back to the beginning anyway. So why not just do it right the first time? What's your thoughts on the Bulgarian method of programming? Um, for people who don't know what that is, is hitting maxes almost daily, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, I've always, I've always said that I, I love the Americanized Bulgarian program thought, but let, let me explain that because, you know, what is a max for the day? I mean, what is, you know, you, you take a number, uh, and, and then let's even just go back farther. I know Abijayev, the, the great Bulgarian coach, when he's developing his athletes from a young age, they didn't, they didn't do that kind of training, you know, but that, that's what people think. Oh yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to take this 10 or 11 or 12 year old and we're going to, we're going to max them out every single day to get them strong. You know, that, that's, that's, that is far, far, far from what Abijayev is talking about, you know, in an ideal world, we want to, because they're professionals, we want to snatch, we want to clean and jerk, and we want to front squat. That's what we want to do. And I add a caveat to that. I want to snatch, I want to clean and jerk, I want to front squat, but I want to work my weaknesses, whatever the weaknesses are. I want to make myself comfortable where I'm uncomfortable. So the the I call it the Americanized Bulgarian method. I really believe in. But I will tell you that in my 50 years of coaching, I've had maybe one or two people that I've been able to do the Americanized Bulgarian method with. It's just, uh, it's, it's just really, really hard to do that. So what I go more by is a perceived exertion of the athlete. So for an example, if, if, um, the athlete today is supposed to be doing, you know, three singles at 90%. Most athletes will say 90% of the, uh, the one RM. Well, well, I don't say that. What I say is I'm going to do three singles at a nine perceived exertion. Okay. And, and it should be, it, it'll, it'll be close to 90%. That's what I'm trying to do. But some days that 90% feel might be really, truly 80% of the one RM. Is that a bad thing? I think not. I think it's a good thing. He's lifting what he's capable of lifting that day. And I want it to be 90%, but I want it to be a perceived 90%. And then there's going to be other days that's 90%, and he's lifting 95% because the weight feels light. You know, mm -hmm. so I... I very rarely, you know, on, on my website, periodically I'll go, I'll write in 90%. But, you know, what I'm really telling the athlete is I want them to not be tied into a number, but be tied into a feel. Feel what 90%. So 90% is 90 kilos? Great. You know, what, you know on a good day what 90 kilos is. What's it feel like? But then on other situations, you know, God, I lifted an 80 today. This, this feels really heavy. So that's my 90%. God, this feels like 90% instead of 80%. Hmm. I would stop for the day and I would use that as my marker for the day. That, that, that true 80%, but it's interpolated as a nine, a nine out of a 10 on a perceived desertion scale. 
you know, Mike, the, the more, like more of these podcasts I do and the more high level guests like yourself that I get on, the more I hear, like feel your way through training. Um, I think it's something that people lose so much. Like if you look at Brian McKenzie or Julian Pinot, like anyone like that at the moment, um, I've had so many guys on that mentioned the way you feel the way through training. I think it's something we lose. Do you, um, do you find that something that really comes up on a frequent basis basis with like CrossFitters especially? Yeah, because you know, we all have egos, right? And, uh, um, you know, you have to be smart. And for me, the smartest man in, in CrossFit is Rich Stroney. I mean, he knows his body better than anybody else. He knows where he has to pick it up. He knows when he has to slow it down a little bit. But he's always in tune with what his goals and objectives are. And, you know, the proof is in the pudding. Well, weightlifting is exactly the same way. I have got a goal I want to achieve. And I know that my goal is going to be set on a yearly basis. And I'm going to work towards that that go so i want to i want to uh take it slow you know and i want to feel good i don't want to cause injury and the guys that you know that go after it 100 percent and by god i'm going to get this 90 percent today if it kills me have a great propensity for getting injured and uh uh you know then then now they're set back three or four weeks or whatever it is and they have to start all over again you know so you know, learning to, learning to feel your body, learning what is needed and understanding the lift or the movement pattern and the positions is absolutely critical. That's why it takes so long. Um, in my school teaching at the high school level, my athletes and my kids that I taught, um, they had me for one year. They did not snatch a barbell for the first semester hmm. it six months we worked on drills and skills and positions six months every single day that i had them they did the junkyard dog the burden of warm-up and the skill transfer exercises and they did body weight exercises and i believe body weight exercises before barbell exercises in the olympic list is very important and i calculate that a pvc is a body weight exercise. So, you know, I do all my movement patterns using PVC pipe. I would, I would teach them the positions using the PVC pipe. And we might even, you know, I might even let them do uh, snatch balances, uh, snatch balances without a dip with the PVC pipe. That's what we would do. We would do that active work in stretching and mobility with the PVC pipe. And uh, it wouldn't be until the second semester that uh, I would actually start coaching them in the snatch. And we would start with the three-position snatch, which is the high hang, mid-thigh, and floor. And, uh, and they would get it. And, and we would start with the PVC pipe, and then we'd put sand in the PVC pipe and, and cap it. And then we'd, I'd take rebar and put it in a PVC pipe, make it a little bit heavier. And then I'd go down to the junkyard, and, and I'd get a, a four-foot, piece of uh you know a cold roll steel and a five foot and a six foot all three quarter inches and then the same length at an inch and the same length and an inch and a quarter hmm. and every one of those implements were heavier so they would get the position to feel a little bit different i wouldn't let them and i would not let them progress unless they were perfect in the position and then i would take them that bigger faster stronger years ago and but now Rogue has a aluminum bar and five kilo bars, and I would take them up from there. And nice. as long as they would hit those positions and do well, then I'd let them go up. That's that's fantastic. Um, how does how does body type influence first programming and and secondly movement patterns? Well, it depends on the individual. I mean, I I know guys that are six three and six four that have outstanding mobility and uh um you know for me just because you know they they're so large i want that athlete to if he's six four i'd want that athlete to be a super heavyweight i'd want him to be somewhere in the neighborhood of you know 250 260 270 even uh you know 130 kilos 125 130 kilos uh and that that becomes an issue because <laughs> I know CrossFitters don't like that, uh, but that mass helps support and, and 
you know, help support the weight when it's overhead. And uh, uh, it's very, very important in my philosophy. Uh, if I had an ideal somotype and a, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, I guess a, a um, what am I trying to say? I, I, what I'm trying to say is I'd give me a short Asian female every single time. You okay. know, or a or a Mexican short Mexican female every single time that has been a gymnast. Those are the first people that I would go after and try to talk them into becoming a weightlifter. And of course, at my school, they'd see me coming and they'd run the other way. And then, uh, then eventually, they they want to join my weight class because the boys were in the weight class, and uh, they found out that they really they really liked it, and they were much easier to coach than the boys because. The boys obviously are very stubborn, and the girls didn't want to didn't want to hurt themselves, and so they became they would listen and they would do what you'd say, and and uh, you know, so they they were easier, much easier to coach. But uh, you know, you really basically, I'm looking for that shorter person. You know, that if I get a five foot ten athlete, I'll, I'll put a you know, this guy, you know, thick bones. That five foot ten athlete for me, I try to make a. Uh, Probably between a 94 and a 105 lifter, uh, you know, under 510, you know, 56 or so, uh, it would be an 85 to a 94, somewhere around in there. Okay. And again, it's it's all genetics anyway. So I mean, um, my son was uh, he was six one. Uh, he's a non eater. He was very skinny, but he wanted to get he wanted to become a lifter. He wanted to do very very well. So our goal for him was to become a 105. I mean, going up through the ranks, going to 85, 94, 105. And, uh, you know, he says, Dad, I really want you to help me do this. And so at, uh, you know, and before I go to bed at night, I'd make a, a very high protein milkshake of about a thousand calories and uh, set my alarm at two o'clock in the morning. And I'd get up and I'd walk into his bedroom with a shake and I'd make him drink that thousand calorie shake. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, and eventually he, 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 I think his maximum weight was 130 kilos, 286. Yeah. That's so, awesome. yeah. So, yeah. you know, you, 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 you don't, I'm talking weightlifting. I'm not talking CrossFit, you know, so that's a very important aspect for me. I like, I like mass to help support and stabilize that bar in the positions that it needs to be supported. Okay. Um, you mentioned that your family, um, it's, it's a huge weight looking family in terms of the, the kind of names you got in there. Can you just go through like how, how everyone got into weightlifting and kind of the, the approach you had to take to get them lifting consistently? Yeah, it, it's, uh, in 1985, um, Rancho Buena Vista high school called me up and wanted me to come over to their school and uh, be their strength coach for all sports and to uh, teach weight training in the physical education classes. And they just, uh, you know, they were going to build a new weight room and uh, um, they asked me if I would design and develop this weight room according to my philosophy. And they said, what will it take for you, for us to get you over there? And uh, um, I told them, I said, well, make me the golf coach. So, so they did, and uh, um, I got to develop this weight room that was state of the art. I had nine platforms in the weight room. Uh, you know, I, I had other things because I had to be, I was going to be the strength coach for other sports. So it wasn't just Olympic style weightlifting; it was Olympic style weightlifting along with you know dumbbells and you know we got into kettlebells and medicine balls. But it was a state of the art weight room, and. Uh, um, what happened was, and in my home we had just built, and uh, uh, I had two children. I had Casey and I had Bo. Bo was, or Casey was three, and Bo was just a newborn. And uh, I'd go to school at six o'clock in the morning. I'd coach, and then I'd stay at school until about six or seven o'clock at night, still coaching. And uh, you know, I was coming home, but I would hardly ever see my kids. And my wife said to me, she says, uh, this is unsatisfactory. You, you're, you're not, you're not going to be able to see your kids grow up. You're spending all that time in the, in the weight room. And I said, Frank, quite frankly, I said, well, this is my job and I have to, 
I have to adhere to this because I'm, I'm not going to shirk my responsibility. And she says, well, I understand that. So why don't you build a weight room in your garage, in the garage? And that's all it took. So, <laughs> so I started out. I started out with one platform. I didn't have any money, but I was asked to, you know, do USA weightlifting courses. So I was asked to speak about, uh, you know, weightlifting in, at the high school level. And so I did, I'd make a little bit of money from that. And every bit of money I made from my speaking engagements or extra work I did, I put into the weight room. And so I built, I built this garage gym that's just, for me, it's the best thing that ever happened, and it's state of the art, in my opinion. We have four platforms. It's only about six hundred square feet, and we've had as many as forty people lift up here, you know. And uh, um, but anyway, so what happened was is that you know we built the platforms, and I would go to work at six o'clock because the kids were asleep anyway. But I'd come home after my job was done. I'd come home about four o'clock. And then all the kids at school that trained with me followed me home. Hmm. So, so I just, we just started coaching them at, at my house. And so we'd coach from five to about seven. And then, the, then after the workout was done, and then they would go home. But we would do this Monday through Thursday. Friday was always the day off. And Saturday at 10 o'clock, we'd come in. And on, on Saturdays, we'd always snatch and clean and jerk. So nice. what do you think? That's it, basically the one. Yeah. What do you that's, think? That's, it, that's Go ahead. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, what do you think it is that makes your gym so special? Um, well, first of all, I think it's it's there's a lot of history in this gym. I ha- I've had, God, I would probably tell you I've had every country in the world represented at my gym. I have two flags that are Olympic flags that anybody that comes up to my gym for the first time signs it, and uh, um, they may want to make a little saying, but. Um, it's it's unique because it's it's barbells it's barbells dumbbells kettlebells free weights there's no machines uh we do um, um we do exercises standing up uh, because it's an olympic style weightlifting gym very rarely do we do bench presses if ever i i have never programmed a bench press well i take that back probably about a month ago i actually put bench presses dumbbell bench presses in the workout because we were on a a different kind of a cycle, but um, I'd never do stuff like that. I always do exercises with my feet on the ground. I do exercises that are explosive. I do exercises that use multiple muscle groups, and uh, um, and we start we start slow and we end fast. You know, basically, it's what slow is smooth, smooth is fast is, is what we do. And I and I think that that characteristic and the history of the the pictures that are on my wall from way back in the you know the 40s and the 50s and the 60s of uh, Norbert Shemansky may his soul rest in peace just passed away at 90 you know at uh, uh, set a world record at 41 years of age with a 363 pound uh, uh, split snatch <laughs> uh, you know and and back in the day because we had three lists we had the bent we had the clean and press we had the the snacks and we had to clean and jerk more and more people did bench pressing type exercises a lot of dips to get strong in the press and that inhibited their mobility so you had a lot more people doing uh um you know split style cleaned and split style uh you know snatches um and you know it wasn't until 72 when they eliminated the clean and press from the olympic competitions that people became more and more squat oriented you know so then they learned that it, that that squat was a much more efficient efficient place to be yeah. and so my gym is one that will i'm not tied into any one method i say there's a lot of ways to skin a cat if an athlete like the rich phoning you know who brings his bar into his hips with bent arms but he's snatching 140 kilos uh and he's a four-time you know, CrossFit Games winner. What do I say to him? Great job, dude. You know, I, I'm not going to try to change him because he's to try to change him at this point in, in, in his development would probably make him make him a little bit worse. Yeah. In the beginning, so I just leave him the way he is. 
and just making. So I think that, that, yeah, that that's a characteristic of the gym. You know, we're you know, there's some coaches out there that say this is my way and this is what you're going to do. I'm not like that. Uh, you know, I have my philosophy, I have my stance, my grip, my positions. I have them developed the way that I've had success with. But if an athlete is, you know, wants to move his feet out a little bit and, uh, and he's doing a good job with it and he's not, uh, uh, you know, he's not missing lifts, you know, then I'll, I'll probably let that slide because he's more of an experienced athlete. But I start everybody out at the same way. My coaching courses are all taught by all my coaches the same way. Um, and then the athlete can go back and, uh, you know, work on, you know, what they feel they need to work on or where they feel more comfortable. So I've got a gym that is very wide open to not being my way or the highway, uh, but we're going to teach it a certain way. And uh, the only the only thing that I demand is the hook grip. <laughs> Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's a couple of kind of controversial areas in, in training at the moment. Um, the first one I think is, is the way that kind of the West side's, um, approach of banded cleans. What are your thoughts on that? Well, Lou and I, you know what, let me tell you a little story here. Years ago, um, my philosophy with Louis about Louis Simmons and the West side method was, was, you know, they were power lifters. We were Olympic lifters and we, we, we're just not going to coexist. We're not going to do that. Um, and Louie and I started talking a little bit and we talk on the phone. I've never met him, but you know, he's, he's just like me. He's very passionate about what he does and he's going to make an athlete much, much better. So I really respect him in that. Um, my son Casey went to, uh, went to West side, uh, you know, to see the new, uh, CrossFit powerlifting uh, SME, and he went there, and you know he came back, and he did some cleans with the bands, and you know he did some cleans off his knees, and and uh, uh, you know he did some snatches with the bands, and uh, but he came home, it was very interested, and he said, "Dad he says, are you sure Mom didn't have another son?" <laughs> and uh, it, it, you know that 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 was so complimentary uh for for me and and i i thought you know what i'm gonna this guy's the dude and so we we became you know i i became more and more enthralled about what louis was doing and uh uh my son bo went up to work with john wellborn and uh i told bo i said whatever you do do not do any of those powerlifting movements that wellborn does i said i want you snatching and clean and jerk. Okay, dad. Okay, dad. So, you know, about six, seven, eight weeks later, he comes home and he's snatching 15 kilos more and he's clean and jerking 15 kilos more. And I'm going, Jesus, Bo, what the hell you been doing? Dad, I've been doing the West Side Barbell Program. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going, you got to be shitting me. I, there is no way. And he says, yeah, but I did one thing. He said, I every day I snatched. And I clean and jerk with the barbell. Nice. I'd spend five five minutes snatching, five minutes clean and jerking. And, you know, it, so I came up with this philosophy. I thought, well, you know what? I can take, and I and I would, and, and I will. I'm going to send lifters to Louis Simmons to get extremely strong in their weak areas using his philosophy. Because I've seen it work firsthand. And I would have never have said that a couple of years ago. Um, but I have all the respect for him in the world. And I will send athletes to him. But he can't send athletes to me and expect me to make them Olympic weightlifters because of that first thing, that mobility yeah. issue that, that the powerlifter has. So I'll get back to your original question after, after a long story. That's all right. Is that... I, I do not believe in snatching or cleaning with bands. What I do believe in is doing muscle cleans with bands, doing muscle snatches with bands, doing, I can actually do jerks with bands. I can certainly do those, but the, the, you know, the momentum 
the bar is going up and that band is going to pull the bar down too soon and you're not going to be able to get underneath it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and you're going to be out of position. And it, in my opinion, it can cause injury. And you know, the, the path of the bar has to remain within the confines of the area of the base. And, and to describe the area of the base is nothing more than taking a, um, a piece of chalk and, and drawing a straight line on your toes, going out about six or seven inches, and then coming down and putting a straight line behind your feet. And that is the rectangle is the area of the base. And in my opinion and philosophy, the barbell has always got to stay within the area of the base to become the most efficient lift that there can be. Definitely. That makes a lot of sense. And the, the other kind of controversial area at the moment is I've been uh, speaking with Julian Pano a bit and we've been talking about internal versus external rotation when, when pressing. Um, mm-hmm. You see a lot of the, the Chinese lifters, especially internally rotating when they, when they mm-hmm. lock out. What's your thoughts on that? Well, it's a good thing that I am open to learning. Uh, my way was, you know, totally externally rotation, external rotation. Um, I didn't, uh, I didn't think there was any room for internal rotation at all. And thanks to Julian and uh, explaining it to me and showing me uh, and explaining how and what the bar felt like. Um, is, you know, internal rotation, a little bit of internal rotation is okay. He wants to combine them. And then, of course, and for me, I went to Julian and I brought out a thousand pictures of Kalecki and, you know, other athletes that are totally externally rotated. And he pointed out weaknesses of the lift. <laughs> I'm going, shit, you know, this guy's such a genius, you know, and, and I love him. I, I would I would like to follow him around everywhere he goes and just to learn from him because he convinced me and I'm a hard convincer and uh, he convinced me that uh, uh, you know some internal rotation is 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 good and necessary to be stronger in the in, with that bar overhead. So uh, he, what I was uh, thinking in the early beginnings he calls adduction where the shoulders are really rolled forward you yeah. know uh and that was my interpretation of what internal rotation was all about and uh uh and and i do not i would not allow that uh, although i've seen it happen with olympians and they do quite well at it so that's where my thousand ways to skin the cat comes in but now uh, if, if i see a person that has too much internal rotation then I'll work hard with them on external rotation, but explaining that we do not want totally external rotation, but we want a little bit of internal rotation. So, you know, a 70 year old is still learning and, uh, and Julian was uh, kind enough to explain it to me. And, and I, and I believe in that now. That's awesome. Um, I know it's getting on in the day. Did you have time for a few quick questions? I ask um, everyone. I've got, you know what? I've got all day. I'm I'm retired. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, who's the first person you think of when you hear the word successful? Oh my goodness! The first person that I think of is being successful. Well, mine. I I got to be thinking as a coach. So for me, the the man that I have the most respect for uh, in the weightlifting world is a man by the name of Steve Goff. Uh, He's a, uh, he's a former Marine. He and I are probably best friends and, uh, he taught, he has taught me, uh, more about, uh, life than weightlifting, actually. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, he's a very successful person that, uh, I have a great deal of respect for. In what way has he taught you more about life? I think it's just about, uh, keeping an open mind. Um, uh, you know, Continue to learn. Um, you know, there's not one way of doing things. There's several ways and that there are different body types. There are people can do it the way exactly the way you want it to be done. And then there's people that can't, but can be very successful. So he's, I guess he's given me more of a, an openness for learning and change and, and, uh, uh, the idea that I need to, be good enough coach 
to train that athlete in a, a in different ways. I just don't have one cue to give this athlete for him to understand. If if the athlete doesn't understand what I'm talking about, I have to find a way to make that athlete understand what I'm talking about. And I have to come up with cues and visualizations to make that athlete feel and understand what I'm talking about. And that's what Julian did to me, actually. And, uh, um, you know, and that's what Steve Goff has been doing for me for several years. Is there a book that you've gifted um, on a frequent basis to other people? Well, I, I am, I love, I love, uh, I love reading. And uh, my, you know, my books that I gift are, uh, are, you probably wouldn't think they would be very good, but they're, they're written by Lee Child and uh, the Jack Reacher novels, you know. Because yeah, I know them well. <laughs> I, I read every time that I can, I, I get a, um, um, you know, I get his books, you know, I, I do a lot of traveling, so I do books on tape. And uh, uh, those were the, when people ask me, well, what do you, what do you read? Because I'm interested in what you're thinking. It's, uh, it's books like that. You know, it's, uh, you know, uh, Lee Childs is probably my fav- favorite author. If it comes to a weightlifting book, I think I think the best book that's ever been written is Olympic Weightlifting by Greg Everett. His third edition is is just outstanding. Greg is Greg is one of my athletes from years back. He married uh, Amy and Naya, who was my athlete, and uh, Greg and Amy trained down here and fell in love down here. And I actually walked Amy down the aisle at their wedding. Hmm. Um, and years ago, Greg asked me to if if uh, if I'd write you know, write a book with him. And I said, you know, that's not my style. And, you know, I'd have to have somebody follow me around for a year or two to just listen to what I say. But he wrote this book and it's, uh, you know, it's Olympic lifting, a complete guide for athletes. And, uh, um, and you know what? It's 99% of the stuff that he's written in there is, is the stuff that, uh, that he and I worked on when he was uh, being coached by me. And of course, he's he's freaking a genius. He's just like Julian. Uh, he explains himself very, very well. He's an outstanding coach, uh, and he's an outstanding person. And I have all the respect in the world for him. So Lee Child would be my go-to if I was going to give you a suggestion on a book to read, just in general. But Greg Everett's books uh, would be the ones that I'd give you for weightlifting. Do you have any daily routines that you follow? Every single day. <laughs> I, I am I I am a creature of habit. You know, I'm I'm an early person. I get up at uh, four thirty or five o'clock every morning. Uh, you know, I I do my uh, bathroom duties and uh, I go outside and uh, uh, do my uh, I weigh myself every single morning. Uh, and you know, and the weight fluctuates. And if it's too high, I'm pissed. And if it's too low, I'm happy. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> I come back in and make myself a uh, a uh, uh, a cup of coffee with uh, bulletproof, uh, you know, Kerrygold butter and MCT oil. Uh, and uh, from there, I usually go to uh, go to mass at seven thirty in the morning. I'm Catholic, and so I'll go to mass seven thirty in the morning, or I'll go to uh, uh, the beach and walk on the the beach if I'm not coaching on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, I'm here. And, and Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'll go to Mass at noon. But uh, uh, we, we're here. And then about 1 or 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I'm pretty much done for the day. So I will get on my Harley and take a ride around the area and drop in at CrossFit boxes and uh, just look around. I love coaching. And if somebody asks me for some help, I'll help them. And But that's my job now. And so that's what I do. You know, and, uh, People call, they'll call me up and they'll come. Can I come up to your house and co- train today, coach? And yeah, and he said, yeah, come on up. And he says, well, what's the cost? And I said, it's pretty expensive. It's free, <laughs> you know. So I don't charge anybody anything. You know, we don't. It's not a business. It's just, it's my love. I've been blessed with CrossFit, and uh, uh, that's what we do. And so I try to do that early morning stuff every single day, and uh, then after one o'clock, it, it varies. I, I can't wait to uh, to be in the States and pass by them. Yeah, I'd love for you to do that. Um, if you if you could speak to your 20-year-old self now, what would you say? 
thank mom and dad. Yeah, you know, I would, uh, I would say that uh, I was a handful uh, growing up as a kid. I was very, very active. Uh, you know, I hell, I was ADD, but back then, no one knew what that was. Um, I wanted to go outside and play, and uh, you know, mom and dad were very strict with me. They had to be. Um, and just the way I was, and uh, um, I didn't listen to them. You know, I went my own way, and then all of a sudden, you know, it uh, uh, getting slapped upside the head by a, a corporal in the Marine Corps. I'm thinking, God, my mom and dad really got smart all of a sudden. You know, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so I, you know, that's that's what I would I would say. I think that I find myself given my kids advice like my mom and dad did and initially it'll frustrate me then i go back you know 50 years and think man was i a dumbass or what you know? <laughs> and, uh, um, and so parenting is very very hard uh but my parents were just outstanding and i grew up in a very loving loving very disciplined household and i fought it every step of the way and uh you know, today my dad would probably be put in prison because of all the spankings I got. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it's it's my twenty year old self would uh, would listen now, you know, knowing what I know. Nice, nice. Well, Mike, thank you so so much for jumping on the show. It's been a, a real honor um, to have you. And where can people find out a bit more about you if they want to? Well, we have a website. Uh, I, I do have a website called mikesgym dot org. It's not active, but there's a lot of good information on that website. Well, there's tons that, of good uh, information. Right. And uh, um, I don't. I used to post my programs there, but you could go back and you can see about seven or eight or nine years of programming that we've had. But now we pretty much go to, uh, uh, you know, www.crossfitweightlifting.com where we have two programs. We have the program for CrossFitters that my son Bo writes and then we have the programming for weightlifters, which is what I write. Nice. So a lot, a lot of good information there. A lot of good, uh, I have an administrative assistant, Amy Taylor, who is like a daughter to me as well. She's a godsend. She's a school teacher in Dallas, Texas or Fort Worth. And, uh, uh, she takes care of our, our, uh, you know, Facebook page and, websites and uh, uh, things like that. And then, you know, I welcome everybody. You, you can email me at Mike Bergener, my name, B-U-R-G-E-N-E-R, -E at Mac.com. You can ask me questions, um, and you can uh, send me videos, and I will I will tell you what I see. No. Uh, and people are very uh, – they don't want to interfere, but for me it's an honor and a privilege to be able to do that because two reasons one it's my love but the other reason is is that if if i'm not keeping busy with my crossfit stuff and weightlifting stuff my wife makes me work in the yard and I don't <laughs> like that. so whoever listens to this don't be afraid to contact me and ask me any kind of questions that uh, that you do I, I answer all questions all phone you can call me. You can text me. My phone number is seven six zero five three five one eight three five. That's dangerous. <laughs> I know. I, it's but it's okay. I'm I'm I like that because again I I hate pulling weeds. You know, so, uh, <laughs> okay, so thank you, Mike. Um, I I really really appreciate it. And I what I'd say as well is your programming is incredible, and it it completely changed me as an athlete just following yours and Bo's. So thank you very much for that. I thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Cool. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Alpha Movement Podcast. Don't forget, you can get access to these shows um, for anyone else. You can watch them live and you can even ask your questions directly to some of these awesome guests via me um, live and I shall answer them before your very eyes. So if you want to support the show, head over to iTunes, leave a five-star review, connect with us on Facebook at facebook.com slash alpha movement official, or you can find out more at alphamovement.co. And I shall see you soon for another episode of the Alpha Movement Podcast.